Amongst Sir David's many accolades is the award of the RSA Benjamin Franklin Medal. The award ceremony took place in 1991 at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., where our esteemed chairman, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, gave the opening address. We are delighted to welcome His Royal Highness this evening to introduce our speaker more fully and to chair the proceedings. This year marks the 59th and final year of His Royal Highness's presidency of the RSA, and we are very pleased to honour his contribution to the society this evening. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to His Royal Highness and the President of the RSA, the Duke of Edinburgh. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this um, final President's lecture, at least of this President. It may go on under another President, I don't know. <clears throat> but um, I know that it's usual for the Chairman on this occasion uh, to introduce the Speaker. Well, if there's anybody here who doesn't know <laughs> practically everything there is to be known about Sir David, you shouldn't... I don't know why you've come. <laughs> So I will take it you know exactly who is going to talk to you, and you know exactly how much he, uh, how, but, uh, how much interest he takes in in the future of the globe. And I think um, all I can say is to thank him very much for sparing the time to come and talk to us this evening. Sir David. Highness President, ladies and gentlemen, may I first uh, um, thank you for inviting me to give this the last lecture in your presidential series. And may I also congratulate you, sir, on your coming 90th birthday. <laughs> you. There is also another significant birthday this year a 50th, which I know that you, sir, will remember. 50 years ago, on April the 29th, a group of far-sighted people in this country got together to warn the world of an impending disaster. Among them were a distinguished scientist, Sir Julian Huxley, a bird-loving painter, Peter Scott, an advertising executive, Guy Mountford, and a powerful and astonishingly effective civil servant, Max Nicholson, and several others. They were all, in addition to their individual professions, dedicated naturalists, fascinated by the natural world, not just in this country, but internationally. And they noticed what few others had done, that all over the world, charismatic animals that were once numerous were beginning to disappear. The Arabian oryx, which had once been widespread all over the peninsula, had been reduced to a few hundred. In Spain, there were only about 90 imperial eagles left. The Californian condor was down to about 60. In Hawaii, a goose that had once lived in flocks around the lava fields of the great volcanoes had been reduced to 50. And a strange little rhinoceros that lived in the dwindling forests of Java to about 40. These were the most extreme examples. But whenever naturalists look, they found that species of animals were populations that were falling rapidly. This planet was in danger of losing a significant number of its inhabitants, both animals and plants. Something had to be done and that group determined to do it. They would need scientific advice to discover the causes of these impending disasters and to devise ways of slowing them and hopefully stopping them. They would have to raise awareness and understanding of people everywhere. And like all such enterprises, they would need money to enable them to take practical action. And they set about raising all three. Since the problem was an international one, they based themselves not here, but in the heart of Europe, in Switzerland. And they called the organization they created the World Wildlife Fund. 
as well as the international committee, several separate action groups would be needed in individual countries. So a few months after that inaugural meeting in Switzerland, this country established one, and it was the first country to do so. And USA became its first president. Then, after 20 years, you became the international president of the entire organization, which is known today as the World Wide Fund for Nature. The methods WWF used to save these endangered species were several. Some, like the Hawaiian goose and the oryx, were taken into captivity in zoos and bred up to, into a significant population and then taken back to their original home and released. Elsewhere, in Africa, for example, great areas of unspoilt country were set aside as national parks where the animals could be protected from poachers and encroaching human settlement. In the Galapagos Islands and in the home of the, Rwanda, of the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, ways were found of ensuring that local people who also had claims on the land where such animals lived were able to benefit financially by attracting visitors. Eco-tourism was born. The movement as a whole went from strength to strength. 24 countries established their own WWF national appeals. Existing conservation bodies, of which there were a number in many parts of the world, but which had largely been working in odds isolation, acquired new zest and international links. New ones were founded, focusing on particular areas or particular species. The world awoke to conservation. Millions, billions of dollars were raised. And now, 50 years on, conservationists who've worked so hard and with such foresight can justifiably congratulate themselves on having responded magnificently to the challenge. And yet, now, in spite of a great number of individual successes, the problem seems bigger than ever. True, thanks to the vigor and wisdom of conservationists, no major charismatic species has yet disappeared. Many are still trembling on the bink, but they are hanging on. Today, however, overall, there are more problems not less. More species at risk of extinction than ever before. Why? 50 years ago, when the WWF was founded, there were about 3 billion people on Earth. Now, there are almost 7 billion, over twice as many, and every one of them needing space. Space for their homes, space to grow their food, or get others to grow it for them, space to build schools and roads and airfields. Where could that come from? A little might be taken from land occupied by other people, but most of it could only come from the land which, for millions of years, animals and plants had had to themselves, the natural world. But the impact of these extra millions of people has spread far beyond the space that they physically claimed. The spread of industrialization has changed the chemical consistency of the atmosphere. The oceans that cover most of the surface of the planet have been polluted and increasingly acidified. And the Earth is warming. We now realize that the disasters that continue increasingly to afflict the natural world have one element that connects them all. The unprecedented increase in the number of human beings on the planet. There have been prophets who've warned us of this impending disaster, of course. One of the first was Thomas Malthus. His name, Malthus, leads some to suppose that he was some continental European philosopher, a German perhaps, but he was not. He was an Englishman born in Guildford in Surrey in the middle of the 18th century. His most important book, an essay of the principle of population, was published over 200 years ago in 1798. In it, he argued that the human population would increase inexorably until it was halted by what he called misery and vice. Today, for some reason, that prophecy seems to be largely ignored or at any rate disregarded. It's true that he did not foresee the so-called Green Revolution, 
which greatly increased the amount of food that can be produced in any given area of arable land. And there may be other advances in our food producing skills that we ourselves still can't foresee. But such advances only delay things. The fundamental truth that Malthus proclaimed remains the truth. There cannot be more people on this earth than can be fed. Many people would like to deny that this is so. They would like to believe in that oxymoron, sustainable growth. Kenneth Boulding, President Kennedy's environmental advisor 45 years ago, said something about this. Anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical, on a physically finite planet, he said, is either mad or an economist. <laughs> The population of the world is now growing by nearly 80 million a year. One and a half million a week, a quarter of a million a day, 10,000 an hour growing. In this country, it's projected to grow by 10 million in the next 22 years. That's equivalent to 10 more Birminghams. All these people, in this country and worldwide, rich or poor, need and deserve food, water, energy, and space. Will they be able to get it? I don't know. I hope so. But the government's chief scientists and the last president of the Royal Society have both referred to the approaching perfect storm of population growth, climate change, and peak oil production leading inexorably to more and more insecurity in the supply of food, water, and energy. Consider food. Very few of us here, I suspect, have ever experienced real hunger. For animals, of course, it's a regular feature of their lives. The stoical desperation of the cheetah cubs whose mother failed in her last few attempts to kill prey for them, and who consequently faced starvation, is very touching. But that happens to human beings, too. All of us who've traveled in poor countries have met people for whom hunger is a daily background ache in their lives. There are about a billion such people today. That's four times as many as the entire human population of this planet a mere 2,000 years ago at the time of Christ. You may have seen the government's foresight report on the future of food and palming. It shows how hard it is to feed the seven billion of us who are alive today. It lists the many obstacles that are already making this harder to achieve. Soil erosion, salinization, the depletion of aquifers, overgrazing, the speed of plant diseases as a result of globalization, the absurd growing of food crops to turn into biofuels to feed motor cars instead of people, and so on. So it underlines how desperately difficult it's going to be to feed a population that is projected to stabilize in the range of 8 to 10 billion people by the year 2050. It recommends the widest possible range of measures across all disciplines to tackle this. And it makes a number of eminently sensible recommendations, including a second green revolution. But surprisingly, there are some things that the report does not say. It doesn't state the obvious fact that it would be much easier to feed 8 billion people than 10. Nor does it suggest that the measures to achieve such a number, such as family planning and the education and empowerment of women, should be a central part of any program that aims to secure an adequate food supply for humanity. It doesn't refer to the prescient statement 40 years ago by Norman Borlaug, the Nobel laureate and father of the first green revolution. He produced new strains of high-yielding, short-straw, disease-resistant wheat, and in doing so, saved thousands of people in India, Pakistan, Africa, and Mexico from starvation. But he warned us that all he had done was to give us a breathing space in which to stabilize our numbers. The government's report anticipates 
that food prices may well rise with oil prices and makes it clear that this will affect poorest people worse and discusses various ways to help them. But it doesn't mention what every mother subsisting on the equivalent of a dollar a day already knows, that her children would be better fed if there were four of them around the table instead of ten. These are strange omissions. And how can we ignore the chilling statistics on arable land? In 1960, there was half an acre of good cropland per person in the world, enough to sustain a reasonable European diet. Today, there is only 0.2 of a hectare each. In China, it's only 0.1 of a hectare because of their dramatic problems of soil degradation. Another impressive government report on biodiversity published this year, making space for nature in a changing world, is rather similar. It discusses all the rising pressures on wildlife in the United Kingdom, but it doesn't mention our growing population as being one of them, which is particularly odd when you consider that Europe, England rather, is already the most densely populated country in Europe. Most bizarre of all was a recent report by a royal commission on the environmental impact of demographic change in this country, which denied that population size was a problem at all, as though 20 million extra people, more or less, would have no real impact. Of course, it's not our only or even our main environmental problem. But it's absurd to deny that, as a multiplier of all the others, it is a problem. I suspect that you could read a score of reports by bodies concerned with global problems and see that population is clearly one of the drivers that underlies them all, and yet find no reference to this obvious fact in any of them. Climate change tops the environmental agenda at present. We all know that every additional person will need to use some carbon energy, if only for firewood for cooking, and will therefore create more carbon dioxide. Though, of course, a rich person will produce vastly more than a poor one. Similarly, we can all see that every extra person is or will an extra victim of climate change. Though the poor will undoubtedly suffer more than the rich. Yet not a word of it appeared in the voluminous documents emerging from the Copenhagen and Cancun climate summits. Why this strange silence? I meet no one who privately disagrees that population growth is a problem. No one, except flat earthers, can deny that that planet is finite. We can all see it in that beautiful picture from our Earth, of our Earth taken from the Apollo mission. So why does hardly anyone say so publicly? There seems to be some bizarre taboo around the subject. It's not quite nice, not PC, possibly even racist to mention it. And this taboo doesn't just inhibit politicians and civil servants who attend the big conferences. It even affects the environmental and developmental non-government organizations, the people who claim to care most passionately about a sustainable and prosperous future for our children. Yet their silence implies that their admirable goals can be achieved regardless of how many people there are in the world, or the UK, even though they, can't, they all know that it can't. I simply don't understand it. It's all getting too serious for such fastidious nicety. It remains an obvious and brutal fact that on a finite planet, human populations will quite definitely stop at some point. And that can only happen in one of two ways. It can happen sooner by fewer human births, in a word, by contraception. That's the humane way, the powerful option which allows all of us to deal with the problem if we collectively choose to do so. The alternative is an increased death rate, the way in which all other creatures must suffer through famine or disease or predation. That, translated into human terms, 
means famine or disease or war over oil or water or food or minerals or grazing rights or just living space. There is, alas, no third alternative of indefinite growth. The sooner we stabilize our numbers, the sooner we stop running up the down escalator. Stop population increase, stop the escalator, and we have some chance of reaching the top. That's to say, a decent life for all. To do that requires several things. First and foremost, it needs a much wider understanding of the problem, and that will not happen while the absurd taboo on discussing it remains such a powerful grip on the minds of so many otherwise worthy and intelligent people. Then it needs a change in our culture, so that while everyone retains the right to have as many children as they like, they understand that having large families means compounding the problems their children and everybody else's children will face in the future. It needs action by governments. In my view, all countries should develop a population policy. Some 70 countries already have them in one form or another and give it priority. The essential common factor is to make family planning and other reproductive health services freely available to everyone and empower and encourage them to use it. Though, of course, without any kind of coercion. According to the Global Footprint Network, there are already over 100 countries whose combination of numbers and affluence have already pushed them past the sustainable level. They include almost all developed countries. This country is one of the worst. There, the aim should be to reduce over time both the consumption of natural resources per person and the number of people, while, needless to say, using the best technology to help maintain living standards. It's tragic that the only current population policies in developed countries are, perversely, attempting to increase their birth rate in order to look after the growing number of old people. The notion of ever more old people needing ever more young people, who in turn will grow old and need ever more young people, and so on ad infinitum, is an obvious ecological Ponzi scheme. <laughs> I'm not an economist, nor a sociologist, nor a politician, and it's from their disciplines that answers must come. But I am a naturalist. Being one means that I do know something of the factors that keep populations of different species of animals within bounds, and what happens when they don't. I'm aware that every pair of blue tits nesting in my garden is able to lay over 20 eggs, able to lay over 20 eggs, a year. But as a result of predation or lack of food, only one or two will, at best, survive. I've watched lions ravage the hundreds of wildebeest fawns that are born each year on the plains of Africa. I've seen how increasing numbers of elephants can devastate their environment until one year when the rains fall on an already overgrazed land, they die in hundreds. But we are human beings. Thanks to our intelligence and our ever-increasing skills and sophisticated technologies, we can avoid such brutalities. We have medicines that prevent our children from dying of disease. We develop ways of growing increasing amounts of food. But we have removed the limiters that keep animal populations in check. So now, our destiny is in our hands. There is one glimmer of hope. Wherever women have the vote, wherever they are literate, and have the medical facilities to control the number of children they bear, the birth rate falls. All those civilized conditions exist in the southern Indian state of Kerala. In India as a whole, the total fertility rate is 2.8 births per, person, per woman. In Kerala, it's 1.7 births per woman. In Thailand last year, it was 
uh, 1.8 per woman, similar to Kerala. But compare that with the Catholic Philippines, where it's 3.3. Here and there, at last, there are signs of a recognition of the problem. The Save the Children Fund mentioned it in their last report. The Royal Society has assembled a working party of scientists across a wide range of disciplines who are examining the problem. But what can each of us do, you or I? Well, there's just one thing I would ask. Break the taboo in private and in public as best you can and as you judge right. Until it's broken here, until it's broken, there is no hope of the action we need. Wherever and whenever we speak of the environment, add a few words to ensure that the population element is not ignored. If you're a member of a relevant NGO, invite them to acknowledge it. If you belong to a church, and especially if you're a Catholic, because its doctrine on contraception is a major factor in this problem, suggest they consider the ethical issues involved. I see the Anglican bishops of Australia have actually dared to do so. If you have contact in government, ask why the growth of our population, which affects every department, is yet no one's responsibility. Big, empty Australia has appointed a sustainable population minister. So why can't small, crowded Britain? The Hawaiian goose, the oryx, the imperial eagle, which sounded the environmental alarm 50 years ago, were, you might say, the equivalent of canaries in coal mines, warnings of impending and even wider catastrophe. Make a list of all the other environmental problems that now afflict us and our poor, battered planet. The increase of greenhouse gases and consequential global warming, the acidification of the oceans and the collapse of fish stocks, the loss of the rainforest, the spread of deserts, the shortage of arable land, the increase in violent weather, the growth of megacities, famine, migration, patterns, the list goes on and on. But they all share one underlying cause. Every one of these global problems, social as well as environmental, becomes more difficult and ultimately impossible to solve with ever more people. Thank you. Lightning, and thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll um, have some questions if anybody feels like it. Um, I, I was just going to say that uh, there's one, one thing right at the beginning. He said that it was WWF who started it all. <clears throat> I think there was one body that was ahead of it, and that was the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, otherwise known as IUCN. And all these people he mentioned were members of that in one form or another. And it, they realized that the IUCN, which was uh, a, a scientific uh, uh, specialist body, were quite incapable of running a wealth stall. And so they, <laughs> um, they, they, they knew what the problems were, but they couldn't really apply the solutions because they didn't have any money and, even, and they didn't have the management ability. And that's why they set up WWF. That was the fund to fund IUCN projects. Well. Unfortunately, what happened, of course, was that um, they raised the money and then gave it to IUCN, but, uh, but they never got any response. I mean, so that the donors, they said, what's happened to our money? Well, we gave it to IUCN. What have they done? Well, we'll find out. You know. So eventually, it, uh, and, and I came in on the scene at that time, there was really uh, a serious rift between IUCN and WWF, because WWF kept saying, well, look, we want to know what you're doing with our money. And they said, it's none of your business. So we then said, well, right, we won't give you the money. We'll do the, we'll do the projects and we'll ask for your advice. Oh, whereupon they disliked each other even more. 
And of course, they were totally different people. One, the WWF were basically fundraisers, and they were people who were appealing to people who had money, and obviously industrialists, uh, multimillionaires. Whereas the IUCN were <coughs> the scientists and the, and the, and the specialists who, who, who um, they, they are brilliant, but I don't know if any of you, or well, probably a lot of you here, but they're not really very good with money. <laughs> and, and so that's how it started. And, and, and um, it was quite interesting because these people, having decided to set, set up WWF, Peter Scott was sent to see if he could persuade me to become president of it. Well, it so happened that I was president of another international organization at the time, and I said, not now. But I said, if you want somebody who's interested in the conservation of nature, you'll find Prince Bernard of the Netherlands at the carriages, and if you nip round there, you might persuade him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he got him. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I did become a, a trustee of the, uh, the international trustee from the, from the beginning, so I did see, see quite a lot of it. And I sat under Peter Scott, who was chairman of it, for a, a number of years. And actually, we had one, uh, we didn't fall out, but one argument, because he was, he was uh, proposing to promote the conservation of nature for the benefit of people. He said, now, you know, we, we, must, we must get people interested in, in this, so that we must have uh, reserves that people can go and, and, and see the animals. And I said, you know, I don't think you're right. I, would, I think we've got to look after these animals for their own sake, not for, for our sake. Uh, you, you, because if that happens, people will always put their interests first. And uh, so I said, no, no, we, we've got to make ourselves unpopular and simply say that we've got to do it. Uh, and so that, uh, things had changed. I mean, we never fell out, if you know what I mean, but it was, it was an interesting discussion. And then, of course, one of the great difficulties with WWF was it, it had a very good story, so it raised an enormous amount of money. And then suddenly we thought, well, what about some projects? Well, the money was coming in much faster than we could turn out the project. So we built up, and everybody complained, why aren't you spending the money? Well, wait a minute, we can't, we can't produce the project. And then, so we started throwing money at projects, and everyone said, what are you doing with the money? Well, well, well. so we then had to discover, decide, discover some means of, of tracing what was going on and making sure that people didn't walk off with it because uh, aid programs, as you probably know, <coughs> the money very seldom gets to the people who need it. And so I, I remember that we made a rule that we were not going to give any money to any projects. If they needed Jeeps or Land Rovers or radios or whatever, we'd pay for that. And we'd pay for people, we'd pay their wages, but we would not give them any money to spend. And that worked quite well. And then I, I got hold of a brilliant chief accountant, we had said, and I said, look, how could we follow the, the, the way this money is being spent. We said, well, do you want to do it 100% because it'll be very, very expensive? And I thought, well, yes, that's probably true. Let's, we've got to admit that uh, there's going to be leakage somewhere, which was, was quite an interesting, um, because you don't want to spend 200 or 2,000 pounds chasing a five bob, you know, that's gone in the wrong direction. And that's what happens in the civil service. <laughs> Anyway, it's, it, it's, it, 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 as you can imagine, there were some very alarming periods during the time that I was president. <laughs> but uh, it, I'm glad to say it's still going. And I'll tell you one thing. I, when I was in Thailand some years ago, uh, on, a, I think, a visit for WWE, I met a lovely man there who was interested in this business. He was called Mr. Viravaidya. And he'd been a, a um, civil servant, and he suddenly... Uh, seized on the, on the serious business of population growth in Thailand. It was over 3%. And it suddenly dawned on him that this was unsustainable. So he started the Family Planning Institute of, of, uh, in Thailand and set about single-handedly convincing, trying to convince the Thais to restrict their families. And, and he, try, he, did, he did everything. I mean, fortunately the Thais had a, a good sense of humor because and, and they're Buddhists, so that uh, they, they had uh, auspicious days and auspicious colors and things. And, and so he thought, well, I'll promote the use of condoms. And, and so everybody, yes. And, and uh, he then, he said, here you are. And he gave me some 
key rings, and the, the, all the key rings had little plastic boxes on them with a condom. <laughs> on. And I said, but these are all different colours. He said, yes, those are auspicious colours. <laughs> And I said, well, there's a black one here. He says, that's for New in morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can imagine the ties fell about, but they started to use condoms. <laughs> and, then, and then he uh, decided that he would... He, he promoted this on television, and, and he went round all the agricultural shows, and he had a... I mean, it was a one-man thing, and it had a tremendous effect. It reduced it from 3% to 1%. But one of the things he said to the farmers, he said, look, you don't need all these children. It's ridiculous. You, you've got to feed them all, clothe them all, educate them all, and, and look after their health. It's, so have a few. And then if you want to go on entertaining yourself, have a vasectomy. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, how do I do that? Well, I'll organize it for you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we, it, it, we'll, we'll have buses running into Bangkok on the king's birthday, very auspicious day. <laughs> And he will go into, and he took over a whole lot of school halls and that sort of thing. And he, and they had, he showed me a photograph of all these beds and everything. And people went in and they, and I said, but did they, how did they take it? Well, he said, they didn't like being seen to have the operation. Oh, I said, really, how do you do that? I had visions of, you know, putting up. Oh, he said, it's quite simple. I blindfolded them. <laughs> We don't need two lectures. <laughs> now, who wants to ask a question? Uh, and please, will you just say roughly your name or give or your uh, zip code or something so to be rec <laughs> recognised? Uh, Zena Martin, thank you, Your Royal Highness. Thank you, Sir David. Uh, that was an excellent speech. Earlier this week, there was a media report that the number of children uh, per family in Japan has decreased and that the government is concerned about that and would like to change it. And there have been other countries where that has been similar and they've been paying families to have more children. What would you say to them to convince them that sustainable population is the way forward? Well, I don't know what more I can say except this, take some paragraph from there. I mean, I've put it as, as clearly as I can. Um, and of course, we all know the awful and, and I, I, the appalling example of, of in ordering people as to how many children they can have, it's, it would be a dreadful imposition on humanity. But uh, we can educate people. We can actually explain to them that they have a responsibility, not only to their own children, but to their grandchildren too. And if they actually care about that, they will not have huge numbers of people, of children. Uh, one of the reasons why there is a huge... Um, birth rate in many countries is that people are so alarmed about what are they going to happen in the future and how many of their children are going to survive to look after them. Uh, so how do you deal with that? The way you deal with that is to improve medical facilities. Uh, and and the, the uh, only answer that I can see, and as I say, I'm, I'm not a politician, I'm not an economist, but the only answer I can see is that we have to take as a world population the welfare of the entire world and that we have to make sure that we continue in the developed countries to, to give what we can, to help what we can in others to achieve that sort of level of education and of medical facilities and so on. Uh, because unless we do that, I don't see what, what chance we have. Thank you. Yes. Peter Borchard, we've, we've had two very splendid talks this evening, both from Your Royal Highness. Sorry, my name is Peter Borchard. We've had two very splendid talks this evening, um, both of which have entertained us marvellously. But I'd like to bring up something else. I think Sir David mentioned, um, I don't think I actually used the phrase, genetic modification. And when you go into any supermarket, you find that quite a lot of their products are proudly stated to be not genetically modified. And you mentioned the Green Revolution of 50 years ago. The green, genetic modification is essential. And we need to find some way that instead of people being proud of avoiding genetic modification, they become ashamed of it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but you're no. about genetic modification of food. Of food. 
Well, I mean, the, the yeah. class for Well, well that, is, that is the Green Revolution, is it not? Uh, and, and Norman Borlaug, as, as he himself said, uh, uh, has simply staved off the problem. Um, and, of course, we, we will have no... Uh, there, there are lots of reasons why some people may be very fastidious about uh, uh, genetically modified food. I don't think you find them on the outskirts of Nairobi, where there's nobody <laughs> with not enough, enough food to read. I don't think you find people going to a supermarket in India and saying, I don't think we'll have those because I'd rather have my children starve than that genetically modified food. So, of course, but, there is, but again, uh, there is a limit. How far do we have to go pressing against these limits before we recognize that we've got to stop sometime? And how much better would it be if we actually were aware of the problem and had sufficient self-discipline to, to deal with it before we are pushed right to the limit. Thank you. There's one up there, and then the back there first. Hi, um, we're Lizzie and Lydia, and we're 16, um, from Lady Margaret's school. And we were wondering, to what extent is it our, our generation's responsibility to, to, like, tack, to start tackling this problem rather than yours? And also, like, what realistic steps can we take? Because, like, uh, yeah. So, yeah. I didn't catch that, sir. Can somebody interpret that? <laughs> <laughs> I apologise, I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> Did you hear it? They asked, um, they asked what steps can they take as their generation to help tackle this problem? What, what steps? Steps. Well, I don't think steps would help. <laughs> <laughs> Remove the steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Education. Awareness of the problem. And the take of responsibilities. It, it um, is very strange what moves populations and changes opinion. I, I sometimes think about the middle of the 19th century when five years earlier it was absolutely acceptable for people to hold other human beings as slaves. And that five years ahead it was intolerable. That the, the nations, the population of the world became aware of a great shift of understanding and of truth and of opinion. And the whole point that concerns me is that the, the, there is this taboo of speaking about population control. And until that ceases to be a taboo, until people recognize that birth control is possible, uh, it won't happen. But when it happens, it can happen very quickly. And provided, as I said earlier, that you have the medical facilities and, and indeed women's empowerment, that, that women have control over their own lives, when that happens, every example we know, and there aren't all that number, but everyone we do know, the population falls. And th it's only there that I can see that there is a solution. It's interesting, the... Um, uh, well, the various countries have tried uh, uh, to limit population by legislation, and, and in nine times out of ten it's failed, because people don't want to be told by civil servants how they live their lives at home. And in, in, in China, uh, although they have the one-child family, but on top of that, they, they try to introduce even str more stringent things through government action. But it was only when they formed a, a, a private, non-governmental family planning association that things began to happen because people were prepared to listen to volunteers, to uh, friends and relations and somebody they respected, they, but they don't want to be told what to do by legislation. And I think that's important. The other point, it seems to me, that people forget is that there's a very close relationship between economic development and population growth. I, I, don't, I don't know how exact it is, but Japan's population hasn't grown all that much. 
but their economic growth has been spectacular. So they, all the people of Japan have benefited from population, from uh, uh, economic growth, because it hasn't been eaten up by population growth. In India, when we left the country, there were 400 million people, and they had, uh, I forget what the proportion of hospital beds to the population, how many nurses, how many doctors. Since then, the population is now uh, over 1,000 million, and the, the number of doctors, nurses, hospital beds, in proportion to the population, has gone down. And so that they, they, they haven't been able, their economic growth hasn't been fast enough to overtake their population growth. Whereas in, in, in Japan, the, uh, economic growth has overtaken, so they've all been better off. And the same thing has happened in Brazil, where the population has grown, but the economic growth has been the same as, as, as Japan's, but the actual benefit to the people has been denied simply because the population growth is... And we really said five new Birminghams. Just imagine the infrastructure of one new Birmingham. Just imagine the water, the housing, the schools, the hospitals, the, the uh, energy requirements. The, I mean, it's roads. I mean, the infrastructure for even... In a small increase in population is extraordinary and it eats up any economic growth overnight. Oh, next one. All right, oh Lord, we've got. Are you, are you allowed to? <laughs> Do you mind if the secretary asks a question? <laughs> he usually knows better. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask what was the, what is the relationship between the issues that you described, David, and population movement, uh, which is also uh, a growing global phenomenon, and in some ways may be a response to this issue of who looks after older people, which is you don't need to have younger people yourselves, there are younger people in other countries who would like the opportunity. So I'm, I'm interested in whether you, how, how you, do you see glo greater global population movement as part of the answer or as part of the problem? Well, it'll be part of the answer for poor people whose land has suddenly become desert. There's no question about that. Um, and uh, we know that the, the earth is changing, we know that climate is changing, we know that deserts are spreading. Uh, we are there, uh, in many deserts, something like a quarter of the population of the, of the world lives in desert conditions. And those are getting very, very much worse. Um, and yet, so, I mean, it's no, uh, I mentioned about famine as though it's a, a danger we see ahead of us. Famine is here. I mean, how many times have we heard on, on, on television and, and uh, uh, people appealing because thousands of poor people can't get enough to eat and drink? Uh, now, why is that? Um, it's not their fault, poor people, but nonetheless, there are too many of them on that particular part of land. They can't sustain themselves, so they will move. So where will they move to? Uh, well, there will be uh, uh, changes, I, I, and I don't doubt that those who've already got it good will wish to hang on to their goodness. So that is not a, a very pleasant prospect of, of uh, people wishing to move and being unable to move. But again and again, it, 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 all, almost every one of the stages in that is due to the number of people. Um, and, and why this nettle hasn't been grasped, I don't know. Well, I suppose I do know. It's difficult. That's why. Um, and and uh, every uh, small organization that we can all think of concerned with conservation, as I am, um, I mean, take a, a foodling example. I mean, I'm, I'm involved with the pres preservation of dragonflies. Well, but dragonflies depend on water. Why, is the, why are there problems with dragonflies? Because Houses are being built on ponds, and ponds are disappearing. Almost wherever you look, you don't have to be a genius or an ecologist or anything else to recognize that at the bottom, the reason that there is this problem is that there are too many people, or more people than can be dealt with or uh, provided for. There was somebody up there earlier. Oh, there's a dark look. Now I'm up at the top. And there's somebody over here, too. You first, and then next. Um, Patrick Green, I'm a fellow of the RSA. Um, so David, I wondered whether you think that microfinance is something that may help achieve some of the aims that you've been speaking about. 
and is also perhaps a positive step that all of us can take from our desks in our office. The reason, the reason I ask is, a friend of mine gave me a voucher for something called Kiva, K-I-V-A, which allowed me to lend money to a female shoemaking commune in Uganda uh, through a system which appears to have a better repayment rate than any UK clearing bank. Um, and they needed the money to invest in shoemaking equipment and they've have paid me back in full, and I've re-lent the money now nine times, and I've been repaid in full every time, so I can take it back and put it back in my pocket, if I wish, or keep lending it. But the only cost to me is loss of the interest, and the data from both Kiva and the charity Opportunity International, which um, Her Royal Highness Princess Anne is patron of, shows that these women's uh, economic activities return vast quantities of the profits they make into the education of their children. So I wondered whether you thought there was any merit in that. Well, certainly, of course. Um, and uh, every one of these, of these enterprises which are, so, which are so valuable locally, they all mount up. They, they, it's an accumulative thing. And again, it's a question of giving people the options. And an awful lot of people, particularly women, in the country, in the world today, do not have options. That's the problem. Just to go back one moment to young and old and the business of, of the old people having to be looked after by the young. Because one of the, although people are getting older, as you can see, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the fact is that we've only, the, the, I think it's this government, has introduced legislation which has removed re retiring age. And that implies somehow or other that people over the age of normal retiring age are, are still capable of doing a useful job. Well, that may not have been true a couple of hundred years ago. When you reach 60, you were probably halfway into the grave, if not all the way. And whereas now, you can go on. I mean, um, I'd probably crash it, but I could still drive a, a, I could drive a, uh, what you call a bulldozer quite easily, I think. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you don't want to worry too much about the, uh, worrying about old people. I think they can probably look after themselves. I think, <laughs> there comes a moment when you make a mess of it, but that's not me. Yes. Thank you. Um, Sir, Sir David, my name's Nigel Ecclesfield. I'd like to take the previous questioner's question a little bit further. Can, can you hear me more clearly now? Is that better? He talked about small moves that we can all make to put resources into local activities to support industry and education. You talked about, I think, the great ethical need for us to encourage women's emancipation, empowerment and education in the developing world. The problem we have is, at the moment, that whatever goes into the developing world is more than extracted by our great financial institutions and the resources that are needed aren't there. So I perhaps like to suggest that the other taboo that we start to talk about is how we, the one billion of us at the top of the seven billion pile, repatriate the resources that we've been taking from some of those developing countries back to them to ensure that education and emancipation of all the populations become part of our, if you like, ethical stance, whether it's religious or political. Well, I'm sure that what you've just said is, is, is not only good sense, but moral sense. Uh, and, uh, but I, I have to repeat what I said before, which is that I, the mysteries of, of economics uh, remain um, opaque as far as I'm concerned. I, I truly get lost, uh, uh, and I, do not, I would not wish to pose as someone who's got economic answers uh, to these problems. That's the job of the economists. Uh, and I am not one. Is that the hand there? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Andy Gibson from Mind Apples. And I just wanted to thank you, well, both of you, for that um, incredibly uh, sort of convincing lecture, which seems that the facts add up so much as to be self evident. And I wonder if perhaps the reason that this isn't being talked about a lot by the environmental lobby in particular is that it is that those groups are often already worried about being seen as an, an anti-people movement that sets people up against the planet and 
and, and sees people as part of the problem. And so I wonder what you think as someone who spent so much of your career bringing us closer to nature and making us feel part of it, what can we do to make this a mass movement that sees people as part of the future and part of the solution and that we can all, all of us get behind? Well, I don't know the answer. Um, um, and it's a, it, obviously it's complex. I mean, sexual reticence is, is a, a, a common characteristic of human beings all over the world. Um, and uh, you might ponder as to why that is so. And, and, and certainly, I mean, traveling amongst um, different peoples, one is aware that, that, that this is a common factor. There is a reticence about sexual behavior. You don't talk about it to other people. Uh, but, unfortunately, the solution of this problem can only be taken if you do talk about it to other people. Well, that's going to take a big shift. I mean, uh, a big shift. It's all very well sitting here in, in sophisticated London, but there are an awful lot of places where the, the reference to those sexual matters is not your business. Uh, and how you get over that, I don't know. Um, but um, it has to be done. It's aggravated also by community customs. There are some places where uh, the number of children that a father can, claims uh, establishes his status in the community. Well, that's a sort of factor which is almost... Imp I don't see how on earth you, you, uh, you get around that. I mean, if it's, if it's part of their uh, uh, community view of life, it's, that's very difficult to upset. Um, undoubtedly, the more you can give, and apparently, I mean, this is experience. If you can give women the, the, the power and the right to be able to establish how many children they want, that is the, almost certainly going to be, will, will work. But if the, if the traditions of their community are such that they just simply have to produce a lot of children for the prestige of their husbands, uh, then it won't work. And, and uh, it's, it's very difficult. But there's no doubt that where they're educated, it works. I mean, I, I told you a story about this chap in Thailand. I mean, he reduced virtually single-handed the growth of the population from 3% to 1% simply by talking about it. And unfortunately, the Thais have got a very good sense of humor. So when they, he went around uh, agricultural shows and he went on, on display and he'd try and sell... Uh, uh, condoms, he blew them up, you know, and had com competitions. He said, come and see which will be the biggest balloon, and that's all. <laughs> and he actually got the, the, the American ambassador to blow mine up on television. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, it worked, because it, it, I mean, the population came down. You know, all the growth, yes. David Archer. Fellow of the RSA, if you see education as being one of the great, uh, or the great way of, of tackling this problem, do we have to tackle another taboo that uh, currently it's thought that issues of population are sovereign and each nation should make its own decisions about how it plans to control population, but have we a duty in, in the rich countries of the world to fund education programs beyond our own borders? I'm not sure whether I heard you correctly, but I... But, uh, the education business, uh, you, you don't have to educate country boys, really, uh, about sexual matters. <laughs> they know. Uh, and one of the problems uh, we have, according to the United Nations, over 50% of, of the human race is now urbanized. That means to say that over 50% of people, or some proportion of people, may not even see a wild animal from one day to the next. Uh, unless it's a rat or a pigeon. Um, and so the realities of life and, what, and, and death and killing things uh, escapes a lot of us. And there is an extraordinary tradition uh, that um, thinks these sort of things should be swept under the table. Uh, and as a broadcaster of natural history programs, um, things are better now, and I, I, th I thank the BBC for that, for allowing us to, to put things on as they are. Uh, but even then, I mean, in the early days, um, uh, w we had a lot of protests. If there was animal copulation seen, for example, 
Well, well, thanks to the BBC, they, uh, they let us go on being frank about this and honest about this, uh, and it doesn't cause uh, the uh, outrage, which it certainly did 40 years ago. Um, but it is, it, it is a, a, I mean, I, I don't want to be too uh, uh, pretentious about this, but, but I, I think that, that natural history broadcasting actually plays quite an important part in keeping, yeah. keeping people in touch with the realities of life and death. No, no doubt. I think there's, there's one other factor which occurs to me is, is that there is actually population competition between either ethnic groups or religious groups. Uh, where there are two of a, in, in, a, in, a, in a particular area, they will try and outnumber each other, which is, also doesn't help very much. In fact, it doesn't help at all. Uh, there was somebody, oh, there's somebody in the middle there. Yes, Kevin. Uh, Fiona Weir, I haven't actually got a question, but as a member of Population Matters, I'd love to take this opportunity to say how very proud we are to have Sir David as a patron of ours and to thank him for putting our message over so very succinctly. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't catch it. Oh, you, you no, she was delighted that you were patron of the population. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, there is, uh, for people, I, 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 if this is a, a moment to do a commercial. Yes. <laughs> There is an organization that's addressing this. Uh, it's called Population Matters. Uh, that's what she was referring as, to. As you've just said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> though, in fact, that is a new name, uh, a new recently adopted name. But there is an organization, uh, and its chairman is here in the front row. Uh, and uh, if anybody wanted to know more about it, I'm sure he would be delighted to tell you. Oh, I, wait a minute. I'm not... <laughs> Can't get away. I'm, I'm the opposition, not the opposition, but the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> I got involved with an organisation called Population Concern, which also changed its name. <laughs> and, and it's now called. What is it called? Population Matters. No, no, yours, Direct. Population Matters. Oh. <laughs> Mine's called something else. It's called oh, well, Interact, I, I think. God knows why. But it, it is, it is. <laughs> so you, you've got a choice. <laughs> And I think it's, it's very important in, in voluntary organisations to always be a choice. And I think it'll all be two of everything. And I God thought, <laughs> well, God thought of that first. But, I mean, for instance, you, 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 it's much better if you had Red Cross and St John, if you AA and the RAC. You, it's, it's always have an alternative, because then you can say, I don't like the face of the chairman, I'll try somebody else. <laughs> somebody was waving an arm about, there's one now. Thank you. Uh, Roland Cherry, I'm a fellow of the RSA. Uh, so David, um, having spent 50 years educating uh, the world about all things natural history, and uh, given the background and the fragile earth that's sitting above you on the screen, is there any particular environment that you think is number one on your red list and you're most concerned about? Uh, perhaps you could tell us a bit about that. Which, which particular environment I... You're most concerned about? Uh, in content. And... Yes. Well, I'm most content. No, no most you're concerned about. Concerned about. Yeah. I think. Well, I, I, I mean, the two immediately come to, to mind. Uh, obviously, we're talking about the rainforest, and, and everybody talks about the rainforest. And yes, we ought to be extremely concerned about the rainforest. But actually, two thirds of this globe are covered with water. Yeah. The most mind-blowing experience I've had in my life as a naturalist is the first time I swam underwater on a coral reef. And I was, I mean, part of it was I was astounded by the sudden ability that I had to be free of gravity, that I could just flip my flipper and I could go up or I could go down. That was wonderful. But what I saw was simply astounding. I mean, simply in terms of beauty, it was astounding. Of complexity, it was astounding. 
every kind of thing you can think of on this coral reef. Well, coral, of course, is made of calcium carbonate. Um, and calcium carbonate uh, dissolves in uh, carbonic acid. Uh, and the seas uh, are absorbing carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere that we are producing. And in many areas, they are becoming more acidic. And they are at risk of becoming so acidic that coral reefs uh, are in real danger. And you may say, OK, well, that's just a coral reef, and he happens to like diving. That's not the point. Coral reefs are the nursery of ocean fishing. Now, as if that wasn't enough, our technologies now are so complex and so sophisticated that we can use all the techniques that we used that the military devised and the air forces devised in order to track things underwater or in the air or wherever. And we can marshal those to track every tuna and every whale in the ocean. And the methods of catching them are um, lethal, obviously, but easy now and 100%. It's com complicated by the fact that, of course, the oceans are regarded as being the world's commons. Anybody could go there, and anybody could do it. So how do you get control over the incredibly sophisticated methods of fishing, which are draining our oceans of our food, coupled with the, the problems of acidification, so that I am enormously concerned about what's happening to the oceans, because we all depend upon them much more than we realize. Yeah, I think that uh, the United Nations missed out when they, they were working on the law of the sea and they didn't grasp the nettle of the, of the ocean commons, which they could have done, because after all, the United Nations represents all the nations and they could easily have, have legislated for uh, what happened on the, on the open oceans. And they could have monitored it, because we've got the monitoring, as we were saying, it's so easy now. You have satellites going around. You, can, you put in... Uh, uh, identification beacons in all the fishing boats and ships and you know exactly where they are and you can follow what they're doing so it wouldn't be very difficult and if, all the major countries would be delighted to lend the United Nations for instance a maritime reconnaissance aircraft and for, for, to do a couple of months patrolling in one area it would be very easy to control the, the oceans it's just that nobody's got around to it but it also requires, of course, that all nations should agree to that. Yes, oh, absolutely. Uh, and yeah. That is not all that easy. Well, they all think now. Anybody? Is it? I see a hand up there. Jill Cochran, I'm a fellow of the RSA as well. You have both said it, really. The United Nations is very important, and there is no spokesman at the United Nations who cares about this enough. How can we make that happen? How can we get someone into the United Nations who will pose these important questions? And who is it who will carry on the work that you have talked about tonight when you, so eloquently, are not here to do it? Who is going to carry this on? I would like to believe that it is a growing movement. I would like to believe um, that uh, more and more people uh, are aware of what this problem is, are prepared to speak about it, which is the important thing. Because actually people have been aware of it for a very long time, but they just find it more convenient on all kinds of grounds, of tact, politeness, and simply a problem of dealing with problems, just to forget about it and think of something immediate problem instead of looking at the far-sighted one. Um, so uh, it, 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 it isn't... It isn't uh, a lost cause by any means. The, we are in a democratic country uh, and all democracies uh, have to respond to the, to the wishes of the people as far as they can. And that is why it's important that people should, be, should let their politicians know what they feel. Because dealing with this problem is yet another responsibility of governments and it has to be, it has to be international. Uh, and uh, uh, I, if our politicians recognise that there is a big groundswell in this country of opinion that something should be done about it and it should be represented on the international stage, then they have, can have the courage to go and do it. But it's, uh, it's a thankless task, of course, and so they have to be urged on. 
Well, the recent sort of argument about immigration is classic. Uh, there, it's quite obvious we, we don't really want more people in this country, but you, <laughs> if anybody says that, you'll say you're accused of being racist or whatever it is, of, of preventing freedom of movement, goodness knows what. So it, it, perception matters enormously, as you were saying. Yes, here, in the, on the, one of those, I don't mind which it is. <laughs> it's, it's an awful lot of... Thank you. Uh, Joyce Aram, also a fellow. Um, so, David, in giving your figures on the increase in population and um, saying how it was more or less controlled by uh, family planning, um, no mention was made of, well, for want of a better word, uh, nat nat natural wastage, uh, people who died through famine, old age, or other uh, uh, diseases, and uh, save for uh, the um, a examples you've given of the animals and birds, um, was natural wastage taken into consideration when these figures were brought together, uh, the ones that you've quoted in your very interesting and eloquent lecture this evening? What effect natural waste is has rather than natural? Yeah. Well, well, well uh, that is uh, almost everybody in this room, when their own personal lives, uh, would wish to preserve life rather than than uh, let it go to waste. Um, and uh, every one of us would wish our children would survive. Uh, and uh, but the that is only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that you must recognize that you have responsibilities there. Um, so uh, I don't know what more I can say uh, to that, except that you do, it's a personal choice, and we have to make it clear that, that, that the responsible choice is fewer children. Yeah, which is a, is a dilemma. <clears throat> it makes me feel slightly uncomfortable, because I was a fifth child. <laughs> So, and the other, it does worry me because if you, if you look at a lot of families, the genius only comes after about four or five. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be stuck with the two oldest ones. <laughs> it's a problem. Primogenitor. Well, yes, but not always successful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got room for one more, I think. There's one there, I see a hand. Or is it somebody's bald head? Oh, no, it's a hand. No. Yes, so David, you purported to find the unpopularity of Morpheus a little bit mysterious, but you must be aware there are reasons for his unpopularity during his life and the unpopularity of some of his successors. Unpopularity of Malthus. Of Malthus. Uh, now, my question is, what can the revived population control movement do to avoid the excesses of some past eugenicists? <laughs> well, I quite, I quite agree. The, the, the eugenic movement, but the eugenic was, movement was well. at its most powerful at a time when we did not understand or did not have the facilities of birth control which we now have. That, I mean, the eugenicists were, were trying to manipulate genetics in, in that sort of way and also limiting the population. So, so I don't believe that we, uh, that, that, that we ought to tolerate being told as parents uh, how, what sort of child we should have. And I am very alarmed that the people should have the facility, which I read of in the newspapers, of suddenly saying that actually uh, there's a facility now in order we can say what intelligent, how intelligent our children yet unborn should be. That seems to me extremely alarming. Well, that, I think, um, uh, winds up <laughs> this uh, session. And all I can do on your behalf is to, is to thanks to David very much indeed for dealing with this, I think, very difficult uh, situation and, and problem with such really great knowledge and tact. It, it is a, a, a problem that future generations, or look, as far as I'm concerned, I'm glad I'm as old as I am. But I mean, you're, you're well, 
Some of you are going to have to worry about it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but somebody's got to sort of pass on the word. Somebody's got to make it apparent, or at least get it talked about. But I think that also there are a lot of practical things that, that can be done. The, the, it's very easy to um, have good intentions and then they turn out to be unsatisfactory. I, I won't go into them, but if you can think of them yourselves. And so un, unintended consequences are really seriously important. And the one thing I've discovered in the, in the years is that the obvious answer to any question is invariably wrong. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>